welcome to this episode of the Five Journeys podcast. I'm Wendy Trubo. This is my co-host, Ed Levitan. And today we're really psyched to have Dr. Isaac Elias back. We uh, we love him personally and uh, are having him on the podcast today. He is a leading expert in the field of integrative medicine, specializing in cancer, detox, immunity, and complex conditions. He's a respected physician, researcher, best-selling author, educator, mind-body practitioner, he partners with leading research institutes, including Harvard, National Institutes of Health, Columbia, and others, and he co-authors studies on integrative therapies for cancer, heavy metal toxicity, and others. And he has a new book out, The Survival Paradox. We're going to talk about that today, and also products that help with detox. So, Isaac, welcome. What a privilege to have you back. Thank you so much for having me. I loved our conversation and our connection, and I'm looking to, to see it fl flourishing. Yes. So uh, I want to be. I want to clarify. It. You're saying having him back, but oh, we yeah, actually yeah. we actually had we interviewed you for our summit, right? That we or upcoming summit in April. So people that we're going to be publishing this way before April. Yeah. Uh, and really look forward to. We had an amazing conversation that I know Wendy and I learned a lot about, mm -hmm. and looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, we love chatting with you. So welcome back. Thank you. Anything we majorly missed in terms of your bio? No, it's it's great. I think uh, you know I'm I'm I started my journey in integrative medicine in healing arts at the age of fifteen, so a little bit early. So I think what what I'm sharing now in my early sixties is a reflection of this multiple decades of being a physician, a licensed acupuncturist, trained vertically in multiple medical systems, many decades in mind body medicine. And being an active researcher with some large NIH grants right now, researching specifically the effects of removal of the survival product protein, galactin-3, through therapeutic aphoresis and what it does for sepsis. So with this in mind, uh, over the years, especially in the last few years, I've come to the recognition of how critical detoxification is. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of my book, my first solution chapter in my book, after I, I introduced the issue of survival paradox, the paradigm and how it works and, and different uh, systems and diseases that are affected by it, the first chapter in the solution is detoxification. So I think it's important for people to recognize that it's not just a, a, a technique, a method. It's the, There's a reason why it's the first step because it is the first step in our physiology. It's the first step. In order to create a change, we need to create space. Mm -hmm. okay. One of the biggest mistakes of detoxification is people have the same lifestyle and they are very busy and they are trying to put detox into a busy life. It's not going to work. You, we need to create space. So once, the, and the only way to create space is by letting go. It's by cleaning what's, what's crowded. And that's the value of detoxification. So when we come to this world, the first thing we do is we take exhalation. We let go. It's the most basic detoxification process. We do two thirds of the time, right? Exhalation is twice as long as inhalation. The last thing we do when we leave this world is we take an exhalation. So this process of letting go that allows for something else to happen is so fundamental and what I'm finding when I kind of contemplate it, preparing for this uh, podcast and thinking about the process as I meditate, it's profound. The power of detoxification is so profound because the depth of the letting go that can happen is so deep on so many levels. And then we have a choice. Do we do it with the mind? Do we do it with supplement? Do we do it with food? How we integrate it by the understanding that when we let go, so many possibilities open to us, right? Right. I mean, you you know it. We've talked about it. It's amazing. So that's why it's important for people to see it beyond or oh, do this colonic or do this NMO or take this supplement. It's understanding. It's really in order to transform, in order to nourish, we need to detoxify. Uh, I think, yeah. That's You're talking so, my language. Well, I mean, I, I love the idea that, because we mo mostly talk about detox from a biochemical point of view. And what right. you're talking about is really not only lifestyle, but when I think of creating space, uh, I think of meditation practice, I think of uh, acupuncture pressure, 
uh, practice, but I also think of just plain yoga. Right. And one of my first re introductions when I first got into yoga was, okay, you go stretch, and then you go stretch some more, and then you find space, and you are able to stretch into that space because you you allowed yourself with the breath you allowed yourself space. So that's I I agree. For me, like you just added another. It's pretty profound that it's not just biochemical, but it's really the whole the whole process. And I heard something thoroughly different. Haha. <laughs> Because I heard, I heard that you can't put detox into a life that's too full. Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, yeah, you got me into yoga. I I started practicing yoga at age fifteen, and I was a yoga teacher for many years. I trained yoga teachers for many years. That I'll send you guys some pictures. You'll be. All so right. I, I still teach yoga now in my retreats, even if I'm not very flexible. So you said something profound that not uh, many yoga teachers often recognize. You know, there are two basic systems that are used very often to create space, uh, Qigong and yoga. And in Qigong, you really are trying to find quietude in the movement. In, yo in yoga, you are trying to find movement in the holding of the asana. So when you get to the place when you are stretching, you try to find the space right there when it's open. That, that's so true. And what I'm finding is the more we know about a topic, the more we understand the biochemistry, the more we understand physiology, the more a simple exercise has a great profundity because you mentioned the space in yoga, but there is a space within our body. There is good space in, this, in the circulatory system. We don't have arteriosclerosis the blood is circulating very evenly. If we have good space in the extracellular space, the space outside the cells, there's no clamping, there's no friction, there will not be inflammation. There won't be a sense of, oh my God, we're not getting good supply, we're in the survival mode. Macrophage will be relaxed. Insulin receptors will work well. AMPK will be activated. The mitochondria gets a sense of everything is clean and spacious. I have time to produce energy in an efficient 36 ATP per every glucose without producing toxic byproducts, right? But if the cell is at a sense of, my God, there's no space, what happens? There's no air. When there's no space, when we are, hypoxia-inducing factor comes in, right? And then, and then PDK gets stimulated, and then the mitochondria is blocked, and then suddenly we get unhealthy metabolism, and based on our genetic, epigenetic, which highway we are on, it will lead to different diseases for different people. So the process of detoxification is a mental process in a, the deepest way. And the deepest way is that when a thought ends, can we really let go and not stick it to the next thought, not make it sticky, which is the tendency of holding, which is the basic driver of survival, of course. Because what is survival? Survival is not letting go of something that has a beginning and has an end. That's really what it is. It's, it's an end. But the same thing then will go into the biochemistry and the extracellular. And that's the importance of the survival paradox as a paradigm and the blocking of galactin-3 with modified cytospectin as a biochemical a, a solution, biochemical response to a very profound concept. But my goal when I speak is I don't want to limit this to just a chemical, a physical disease, because it's all interrelated. And we are, we are very much in sync, you know, from our philosophy, from our belief in this multidimensional. So yeah, creating space is what allows things to happen, definitely. Go ahead. You've mentioned Galactin-3 a few times, so I was hoping you could talk more about it. You talk a lot about it in your book, The Survival Paradox. So can you, for our listeners, talk about this and why it matters, what, what difference it makes, how do we impact What is it? <laughs> yeah, of course. So Galactin-3 is a carbohydrate binding protein. It's the most researched lectin. You know, people know about lectins and people can, people can be allergic to lectins, but it's, it's something that came into the attention, you know, lately. But uh, I've been involved with collecting research for almost 30 years. And uh, what galactin does 
So there are different galactins. The most researched one is galactin-3, which is about 10,000 published papers. So galactins, I coined it our survival paradox protein. And why? Because when we go into a survival mode, we are all built to survive. That's how we survive, every cell in our body. And we respond to survival automatically through the central nervous system, through the autonomic nervous system, either with fighting, which equates to inflammation, to struggle, that creates kinetic heat, that creates a lot of density, there's no space when you fight, there is contact, or we run away, we hide and create a shield, a microenvironment, a biofilm, a lattice formation that is that is actually biochemically and structurally created by galactin-3. So galactin is a protein. It has a place where it attaches to different carbohydrates. And it creates pentamers, five of them. It attaches to each other. And you literally create a coating which allows bacteria to hide, viruses to hide, parasites to hide, heavy metals to hide, mycotoxins to hide, emotions to hide, and creates toxic environments. So if we detoxify, and we don't dissolve these areas, it won't work. So what the galactin-3 does is once the nervous system, if we go into a sympathetic mode, we can take a deep breath, right, do yoga, and we go into a pure power sympathetic mode. But biochemically, once it turns on, it doesn't turn off so quickly. And it turns on within minutes by galactin-3 going up and recruiting the immune system. I've shown in, in research I've published that galactin-3 spikes before interleukin-6. And when we block galactin-3, <clears throat> we prevent the spike of interleukin-6. In fact, that's the whole approach to treating sepsis. So we got this alarm protein that helps us with survival. By how? By creating inflammation as an immune response, immune dysregulation. Example is what's happening with COVID right? So many people are struggling with it. And, and by creating a shielding, a micro, a micro environment that leads to fibrosis, to dysfunction. So the galactin-3 is like the alarm that goes to the place where there is problem, different nasty ligands, inflammatory ligands, immune modulating ligands, sticky ligands that creates stickiness between molecules called integrins. They all are, are brought by galactin-3 and you create a different microenvironment for people to understand. It's like a different physiology in a certain part of the body, right? People say, I was so healthy. I woke up one day and I had cancer. Well, it didn't happen one day. Certain reasons led certain areas to develop a certain microenvironment where the body couldn't control it anymore in a healthy way, in a spacious way, Wendy, like we mentioned. So it reverts to survival. It tries to, 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 to deal with it through inflammation, which creates mutations, which can create cancer. So <clears throat> that's why when you block galactin-3, because it's an upstream, it's at the beginning, it's like shutting the waterfall of the immune dysregulation compared to trying to address different cytokine, which is like catching a waterfall with, with a bucket. Not, not an efficient idea. So uh, that's the importance of galactin-3 and addressing it. And in the end, when we are stressed or in a survival mode, stress emotionally, physically, injury, toxins, anything that causes us to function in a disharmonious way, it will affect galactin-3. And the thing with galactin-3, because it's an upstream molecule, you need very little change to create a mega change in the downstream prot a, a, a cytokine, the downstream molecule that does the final damage. And, and again, it's a testament to the upstream role of galactin-3. Galactin-3 will go up by 20%, 30%, sometimes will double. Interleukin-6 will go up a thousand fold because it's a downstream a cytokine. So that's the importance of galactin-3. And if I wasn't clear enough, please let me know. So are we looking at are we looking at preventing galactin-3 from being released or are we looking at quieting it once it's released or both? We're looking at quieting it. <clears throat> it will be, but once the system gets quiet, naturally less galactin will be released. So when you use modified cytospectin, <clears throat> you won't necessarily see a reduction in galactin-3. 
what will happen is that the modifies it was pectin because it has galacturonic acid itself. Pectin is a long chain of galacturonic acid. It's a, a sugar. It's a six carbon, it's not glucose. It's a long chain and it has side chains, different side chains. But it doesn't get absorbed, it's too big. We chop it to a very specific size and a very specific structure. That's why pectasol is a, all the research was done on pectasol, about 80 published papers. So then the galacturonic acid in pectasol will come to the galactin-3, will dislodge the nasty ligand and will break the pentamer. So now galactin-3 is blocked. It cannot cause damage. When it doesn't cause damage, once the inflammation goes down, then galactin-3 will go down because the body's alert system is finally quieting down. So I remember I came from a, from one of my trips to Tibet where I was too high and had really lack of oxygen and had uh, you know severe palpitation, probably from lack of oxygen. And I was in a survival mode. I mean, I had... I mean, it's an interesting, you know, how sometimes when you give, you get back. Sometimes you don't get back. Sometimes you get back very quickly. So usually in in this in these regions, there's no electricity. But as I went up that time, it was 2015, I found out that the remote areas I'm going to have electricity. So I told my daughter, wow, we really need to buy an oxygen generator for these people. We are treating some very sick people. Getting oxygen is going to save their life, you know. So we bought an oxygen generator and they gave us as a gift a pillow that you fill with oxygen and you breathe. So we filled the pillow. Sure enough, it saved somebody's life a few days later. I just didn't know it's going to be my life, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember the sense of driving down and having one pillow of oxygen. I have to manage until I get 1,000 feet from 15,000 feet. You know, it was quite a journey. And Galactin 3 went up from usually mine is 10, 11, it was 17. So once I went, you know, into my regimen and I did therapeutic aphoresis, I needed something more dramatic to really clear the body. Then, yeah, my symptoms went away. My galactin-3 relaxed back to 11. How often are you checking your own galactin-3? I check it every few months. It can change, it can change in 20% of the population every three months, but it's really important, critical, and essential. I made my point for people to realize you don't, decide if to use or not to use modified citrus pectin, pectosol based on level of galactin-3. Who needs to use pectosol? Anybody who is breathing, literally. Because as we age, as we go through trauma, as the body is repairing, it mobilizes galactin-3 and causes damage. Centurions have lower level of galactin-3 than people in their 70s and 80s. It would help us to really get it has a direct factor on longevity. It's not the topic. I don't want to go into it too much. So we need it anyway. The levels are very individual and they are based on expressions of methyloproteinases and the ratio between pentamers and monomers. So you can have a low galactin-3. It doesn't matter. You need to block it based on your health. So if you're very healthy and, you know, and let's say in your 40s, it's the latest, 30s, 40s, very healthy, no issues. Yeah, five grams a day will be enough. If you have any of the chronic inflammatory degenerative diseases, the high toxicity, then you got to take the full dose of 15 grams. The reason for checking the galactin-3 is that for certain people, galactin-3 is not only a prognostic indicator of what will happen in the future, but it can help us to follow the disease. For example, metastatic cancer sometimes or autoimmune diseases. In these patients, following galactin-3 will tell us how much better they are doing. In the other category, you may have a healthy patient, you do a galactin-3, it comes back elevated, and this means there is a time bomb going on. And once you, so you need to assume they have inflammation and, 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 and fibrosis somewhere. Once you treat them, you will see galactin-3 will come down, will come down. And so this is really why you do it. If you have somebody who is healthy, but galactin-3 is elevated, and what is elevated? Do not rely on the standards in the labs because the standards in the labs were based on the approval for heart failure. And patients with heart failure that were tested in very high percentage of kidney disease, very high percentage, certain level of, of chronic kidney disease. The galactin-3 doesn't get excreted as well. So the standard of under 17.8 being normal, no way. Anything about 12, you get concerned. 
especially now when it's automated, every lab does it, it's automated, the values went down. And I know as somebody who has seen thousands and thousands of galactin-3 results. So that's a little bit about the relationship between galactin-3 and use of modified C2 spectrum. So I'm assuming people with like chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, all those people are sky high galactin-3? Very interesting. So Lyme disease is not the case. Now, Lyme disease are the category of patients <clears throat> that maybe benefit most or close to most from a modified tissue spectrum. We have large Lyme clinics where now every single patient gets pectosol. Why? Because you don't get the Herxheimer re reaction. And why? I mean, universally. And they can tell you, wow, my mental... I'm clear, I'm clearer mentally because galactin-3 disrupts blood-brain barrier, activates microglia, causes neuroinflammation, and activates the inflammatory post-perfusion lack of oxygen to the brain, and because of the effect of, of MCP on the, on the biofilm. But the reason is, when you give a regular binder, it's like you take all the drawers in the kitchen and you throw everything on the ground. It's a mess because you peel off and that's why people get a reaction. You know, it takes time to clean up. Modified respectin regulates, attenuates, lowers the dysfunction of the immune system, the over-inflammatory response. So you got something that is calming, that is balancing while it's cleaning. And it has a great affinity for heavy metals. I've published a lot of this with the USDA. So you can use it, you can add other binders, but it's it's so much beyond the binder because of its other effects on galactin-3 and on immune regulation, which is key. It's not, it's not only immune enhancement. Immune enhancement is a double-edged sword because, you know, when you turn the fire, it's going to burn everything. It's about immune regulation. In survival, we got to survive. The body does the best to survive. That's very important for people to realize especially when you look at things from the past, the traumas, and you say, why did I do it? Why did it happen? Well, this was the best you could have done at the time. That's the principle of survival. Now, as part of detox, we are in a different place, we're in a different time. We can allow ourselves to let go. It's not easy. Why? Because there are neurological printed patterns in us, multi-generational, you know, is the Holocaust, the you know, my, my grandfather, my, my grandparents being in the Holocaust, my mother escaping, and I write in my book, Healing the Scars of Survival, how I healed from my grandfather's trauma. So part of this multi-generational healing is part of detoxification. And uh, again, we have only an hour, but I can go so much just on this topic because it's a lot of what I teach in my retreats is how to, how to create a multi-generational healing. Uh, Every time we talk, I have to take citrus pectin, you know, and then I, so when you're looking at detoxing people, are you, is, is citrus pectin the foundation of what you're using modified citrus pectin? So I'll, if you look at my programs 15, 20 years ago, I used a lot of supplement. I didn't always use pectosol, modified citrus pectin. Now it's automatically my first supplement for anyone because you cannot get it through food. And it addresses, if you saw the list of diseases that it's affected, and it addresses it at the top. And because of this, if you look at research, let's say in oncology, you see there is, and some of it we publish, some of it other centers. And so you can see it, it works synergistically with multiple chemotherapies. It works synergistically with radiation therapy. How does it happen? Because it allows the body to heal itself. For example, we just presented at the biggest cancer conference in Europe, our multi-center trial uh, from six different oncology centers in Israel on biochemical relapse of prostate cancer. 18 months, that's a long time. Compared to baseline, how much we were able to slow down the progression or stop it and reverse it, 90% of the patient had benefit, nine zero. Now, MCP didn't kill any of the cancer. It's not what it does. It allowed the body, because what is biochemical relapse for people who don't know? You take out the prostate, can, prostate with the cancer, there is no cancer, PSA is zero. And then it starts coming back. 
you know it's cancer, there's no prostate. And then it's just beginning, usually a little bit more aggressive than the original one. And now you are giving the body something that allows it to address the issue by itself, by fine-tuning the immune response, reducing the inflammation, and the body does a very good job. And so that's an example in one area. And so this is why it's so important. It's something I take every, every single day. Sometimes I get lazy, I don't take 15 grams, I take just my morning dose, but then I take seven and a half grams, which I already took this morning. So does it have to be with food or without food, or it doesn't really matter? It's better with, without food, but it doesn't, it's not critical. Even 10, 15 minutes before food is, is fine. So I take it as part of my pre, pre-food routine in the morning and before bedtime. It's very good before bedtime because you get a lot of also help with the gut and the gut connection. Can you take too much? No, no. People are smart. And just just like I said many years ago in a big medical conference, the job of the doctors is not to stand in the way of the patient, right? Which regular doctors do so much. Part of detox, right? We hold (laughs) to concepts. So, So as part of it, Certain patients had, had a high level of galactin-3. They were not responding to certain prostate cancer patients. They were not responding to modified citrus pectin. And one, two of these very smart people said, you know, I have a lot of galactin-3. I'm going to take 25 grams. Sure enough, they started responding. So people with very high level of galactin-3, above 20, unless it's from kidney failure, will need to take more. You just have more, there is more to clean, you know, you need, you need more cleaning agent. But once you are better, you can definitely go down to a lower dose, but you will feel a difference. For example, Galactin-3 was going to be approved by the FDA as a marker as a, for a risk factor for diabetes, just as the company who developed the assay went out of business. So Galactin-3 affects sugar metabolism. If you take enough modified citrospectin, you will see in your patient a reduction in hemoglobin A1c. You know, it may not be dramatic, but it's done with an extracellular effect that has an intracellular effect. And that's the beauty. So you can combine it with your intracellular detox stuff, onocchiol, curcumin, berberine, you know, quercetin, the things that affect, you know, the different pathways. So I, So when I... When I treat people, I mean, I see all this pathway into a cellularly, but I also see, you know, their pathways outside and it's all together. <laughs> so do you find... Uh, I know this is fascinating. So I, I know that our patients listen to our podcast, so I know we're going to get some requests for Galactin-3. So I guess my biggest question would be, as we're checking this on our patients, because we're going to start, do we? Are, are there any times where we want to say to people, we don't want to do this until you're out of the situation or if you just had a big bender or is it fasting? Yes, not yes, fa- like yes, when are yes. those times not to do it because it's going to be falsely elevated? Totally. Anytime they got a scar. A scar? Like a surgery? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So if somebody, you can have people who are healthy, had a scar 30 years ago, they don't tell you. And they have high galactin-3, and you ask them, and you look, and you'll find, oh, my God, my scar has been itching for 20 years, right? We see it, it's still red. And when you do neural therapy into the scar, and you calm down the scar, the galactin-3 will come down. Absolutely. So scarring, that's why my second chapter, addressing the scars of survival. So we have the physical scars, and that's why neural therapy is so profound. But we have emotional scars and psychological scars. And that's, that's why we started with detox and we, 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 we no, we're going to end with detox because detox is about letting go of scar because scar is a stuckness in a place that there's not supposed to be hardening, right? There's no flow with the scar. And, you know, for me, it's kind of mind-blowing how when you inject somebody's scars that they had 30 years ago and it gets thinner and it never comes back. So some people talk about membrane potential, you know, and proken doing it. But for me, I go to a very different realm. The local tissue is stopping giving feedback to the brain that there is a problem because you numbed it. And the brain lets go and it doesn't reassemble the same memory. 
So it's really, it's, it, so every single patient will have some level of improvement in their scalp from 10% to 80%. But whatever the improvement is, will never come back. So that's the process that we are all together trying to, to initiate and support in the process of detoxification is letting go of what is not needed, right? That's what detoxification is getting rid of toxins. And within it, we have to recognize that as we detoxify, as part of our metabolism, we are producing toxins, right? And we are bombarded with toxins, heavy metals, industrial pollutants. For this, we can have some control. We can have HEPA filters. We can live in a clean place. We cannot run away from pesticides, by the way, even if we eat organic. They are everywhere. All of us have glyphosate. And that's the importance of glyphosate detox and the effect on the gut. I won't go into this and using it together with spectrosol. So if we realize this, we want to ask us ourselves, is there a way where we can really get rid of toxins so they don't come back? And there is. No, because you keep getting exposed to more. So how? No, no, no I'm, I'm going somewhere. You know me. I want to bring something. Yeah, I, I feel like I have to give you like a drum roll. Eli. Oh, <laughs> so, so it's not that we get rid of toxins, but if something which is toxic becomes non-toxic, then there's no longer toxicity. So one of the biggest steps psychologically, and it's a big step in meditation, is acceptance. The more we accept things that usually trigger us to reactivity, the less things are toxic to us, right? So there are certain things that upsets us. And then our blood pressure goes up and our neuroepinephrine goes up and our glucagon. Well, that's a toxic reaction, right? We all agree. If we just accept it genuinely and it just doesn't trigger us, we just had less toxins, right? So the organ that does it in the body is the heart. Because the heart takes all the dirty blood that everyone doesn't want. With an open heart, right? Otherwise we'll be dead right now on, on, this, on this podcast. Takes from everywhere. And it needs to take, otherwise it can't function. It needs the pressure of everything that we don't want. Coming from our past, because it's coming right, whatever comes to the heart, it happened in the past in the cell. Either five minutes or 50 years ago, if it's a certain food or experience that created a certain molecule that affected the cell that now, that's why when you do detox, right, you know so well, people have memories about the past and things come out. The cell is letting go. We connect with the universe through the breath, the power of connecting with the universe, which is credible. And then the heart takes the clean blood and it gives it everywhere. And once it, and once it gives it and it relaxes, it nourishes itself closest to the heart through the coronary arteries. So the heart nourishes itself in order to nourish others, but selflessly after it's done. So when we connect with our heart, we start to transform the toxicity. So in meditation, it's the practice of tonglen, of taking suffering and, cre and giving love and compassion and healing. So the reason why people learn it so quickly, because we, we are built to do it, you know, it's the Tikkun, the fixing in Kabbalah in Judaism. So connecting with our heart is very, very important. For me personally, I had pain here all my life since very early age until a few years ago. And I knew it's not mine until I realized it's from the trauma of my grandfather, from the Holocaust that just, he died from stomach cancer when he was 52, 53, because he couldn't stomach the trauma. My grandmother survived another 50 years almost. And on a graveside, my mother suddenly told us, you know, your grandfather, Hitler, killed 10 out of the 12 siblings. We were never told, can you imagine? And he just couldn't stomach it. It was never talked. And when I did my work with it, being aware of it, my chest suddenly opened up, you know, like after 50 years, you know, it's not common. And I could feel this opening. But what was interesting, and it was related to letting go of the trauma of the Holocaust, accepting it having a certain level of, of forgiveness, which is hard for to even express because people say, how can you, how can you go through such a thing? And uh, once it happened, my mother, who could never watch any programs on the Holocaust, was able to suddenly turn on the TV and watch programs on the Holocaust. I didn't tell her what I went through. 
But because it was a multi-generational healing, it went backward to generation and came back one generation, which we know scientifically happens. That's the power of detoxification. So when we get the heart into the process and we create space and we define what we want to detoxify and we become more forgiving to ourselves and to others, we become self-loving as part of loving others, not as part of a narcissistic approach, then anything and everything is possible. But it starts with detoxification, right? It started with the letting go on the cells and when the heart taking it in. So that's why detox is so basic. I have a question. How can we bottle this? I, I love talking to you, Isaac. Because like, how do you go from biochemistry to multi-generational healing to self-love to compassion back to biochemistry? Like, this is this is really like this is I want to bottle I, you. Yeah, this is this is why I teach, you know. So I, I do it in a retreat environment a lot in Israel for de- a decade. And now in 2023, probably in the second half, I start doing it in the United States. There is a way in the right environment, a few days of the right diet and the right environment and the right explanation and meditating and exercise. It's amazing what happens, especially in the level of multi-generational trauma. I mean, things that are too wild to, to talk in public, but when, when we get together, I'll tell you things that you think are impossible. Now, as somebody who was fortunate to treat and study from the greatest meditation masters in the Himalaya, you know, uh, that are not alive anymore, uh, one of them is still is 96, then uh, I know that, you know, it's very important us to understand that we have the limitation of what our ordinary, logical, linear line mind can, 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 ex- can really comprehend. Reality is much bigger, it's multidimensional. And we go back to the space, Wendy. When we create the space with detox, we give room for new experiences. And that's why the aging process, in many ways, is an amazing process. We mature, we become more refined. But if we are so focused on the fact that we have pain and we don't feel well, we kind of miss the value of it, you know, the refinement of it. The, and that's part of the process of letting go and creating room for the next level and letting go. So people who are meditating, it's very important. That's maybe the most important tip for meditation. Whatever you experience in meditation, don't hold to it. If it's a bad experience, you don't want to hold to it. If it's a great experience, you get really attached to it. There are a lot of meditation systems that are based on somebody having an amazing experience things are enlightened and teaching it. It's just an experience. It's don't, uh, don't hold to it, then it's a survival holding. So then everything becomes a flow. And when there is flow, there's less toxicity. I have a question, Isaac, because a lot of what I have, one, I have more than one, but the one that I've sat with while you're talking is that most of the things you're referring to feel like they're emotional, mental, psychological, spiritual toxicities. How does the process of letting go translate into the biochemical toxicities? What impact does it have? How do you, how do you see that on mercury and glyphosate and environmental toxins and pesticides? How does that relate? It's a great question. It's interesting for my, you know, your podcast is called The Five Journeys. My journey is that on one level, without knowing because my initial work on Galactin 3 was in cancer. I kind of stumbled around the fact that when you block it, no, I, I, I observed actually that when you block it, you affect inflammation and fibrosis early on, late 90s, and I said, wow. So I kind of went into the biochemistry of changing the survival response. At the same time, I had this, this spiritual meditation journey, which I'm still on, and it comes together. So it's all interrelated. We want to ask ourselves, what causes us to lock in? Yeah, it can be emotional, it can be psychological, and it can be pesticide and heavy metals. And what happens when we clean, and if we have a lot of biochemical toxicity, it will still affect us. Unless we are truly extraordinary people that they are very rare, you know, uh, they say like a star in the middle of the day, you know, it's not for us ordinary people that can handle toxicity, nothing happens. 
Toxins will affect our membranes, and like, like you said, will affect our biochemistry, will create a survival metabolism, anaerobic or aerobic glycolysis in the cell, and will create diseases. So you got to, you got to address the biochemistry. But when you address it with an understanding that when you really relax, when you really open, then when your mind gets spacious, when you're not triggered by the same way, it's going to affect your neurotransmission, your neuroendocrine system, your gut lining, because the gut doesn't feel threatened. The biofilm becomes more relaxed. The healthy bacteria can be more dominant. There can be more diversity in the gut because there's less fighting. Well, the gut lining gets better, you get less autoimmunity, you absorb less toxins, right? What does glyphosate do? It disrupts it. So that's why there are certain things we have to take. You know, I take my, my pectosol and my glyphosate detox every day. But I also try, no matter how busy I am, when I wake up in the morning before bedtime, I sit and I meditate. And one thing that I recognize when I meditate, so there's the experience of the regular openness of meditation, which you know, I've trained for decades and decades. But then I, I, then I go into the journey of seeing how it can affect my body. It's amazing. It's almost like I ask myself, why did it take 50 years for me <laughs> to feel today what I didn't feel yesterday? But I know tomorrow it's going to be different, you know? <laughs> so, and I realized, wow, our ability to heal, you know, I had severe long haul COVID in August, severe, uh, because of certain unusual triggers, almost died. I thought, you know, I get like paralysis in half of my body and I totally healed. Now, I used my tools, I used the pharesis, I used, but really what turned it around is the mind. And I find it, so there's a lot of people with, with COVID long haul and a lot of people have chronic diseases. People are holding to their diagnosis, they are identifying with their disease. So for me, it was interesting because I was actually treating people who flew in with severe long haul because I treat it. And then they realized, oh my God, I like what they have, but worse, you know? I mean, I basically canceled everything for weeks, except I would somehow come to see them because <laughs> they came from far away. And then I realized, wow, you know, I have a choice. I can identify with it. I can freak out every time. It feels classically like an MI, chest pain, pain. Or I can understand. It's just the cytokines. And this, so, and, and this addresses your question because I, I've been thinking about it before the interview. Today, and I also have a summit about regeneration that relates. So this really relates to what you are saying. So there is the change in the mind that will take time to be delivered to the biochemistry. It takes time. It's a mind-body connection. It takes time. So the mind feels great, but the body is still sensitive. Over time, the mind is going to affect the biochemistry. And there is a biochemistry that affects the mind. So with cleaning the biochemistry, we have a choice. It's a little bit easier in some level. We take certain supplements, we do a certain diet. Mind a little bit tricky. But once we connect the mind to the heart, it starts moving faster. How do we process? What's the, what's the in to get the mind to the heart? people like is there one technique or is there three techniques that yeah yes yeah. so really the the key meditation technique is tonglen the, this meditation that takes in now the the regular tonglen is the universe that is taught for you no know, for two thousand years usually i don't share it in a podcast probably going to be the first time is that we take in suffering and we give love and compassion because that's what happened to the heart so as part of my insight in meditation, it happened to me a few years ago, I kind of discovered an inner tongling, a tongling that happened in the cellular level. It is not, it's not taught, you know, it's very different. It requires much more supervision and guidance, but it's very powerful because one thing for, you know, that we're all interested in, we talked about multi-generational, we are made from countless beings, if you look at each generation being 25 years, right? You go 50 years, it's four. You go 100 years, 16. You go 1600 years, 
64, you know, it's like the chess game, too. They didn't have enough grains. It's an infinite number. So infinite number made us. The, these people and the people that affected them epigenetically, Holocaust being an example, right, are actually affecting our genetics and epigenetics. They are affecting our cellular function. So their suffering is actually affecting us. We are holding it. We are suffering. You know, in, there is a famous saying in Hebrew, Avot achlu boser v'shinei banin tikhena, which means our, our ancestors ate unripe fruits and our t- the color of our teeth changed. Interesting how they had, right? It's, this, is epi- this is an epigenetic effect. So if we can find a way to do the tonglin by take their suffering that we are holding intracellularly, then it really speeds up. But it has to be done in the right way because a lot of stuff comes up. And I have had remarkable healing experiences in this, even with regular tonglin. One of my most amazing patients that I write on in my book in, the, in chapter six, The Heart of Survival, Charlie, who came with a metastatic prostate cancer and was with me with, for 18 years. He was a, a Vietnam vet, a commander in the, in the helicopter that would fly very, very low. And, and, and then like they were like the bait, and then there were the planes up. And he would see the people who are trying to shoot him eye to eye. And he either gets shot down or he has to shoot them. He was the kindest man. He got shot down eight times in one year. He had to fly with his arm like tied so he can fly. And so, of course, he had, you can imagine the PTSD. But when he learned this first time in a retreat, and so he had, he had pain from his prostate cancer in his pelvis for years, but when we, he learned it from the first time in retreat, the Tonglen is part, it was just only in the clinic, two days, just came during the day, and one meal together and everybody went. But we had a strong relationship. I was with him also when he, when he left his body, the story is all in the book. Uh, really worthwhile reading. And so when he came the next morning, he said, look, all night I went back all the way to my childhood, every trauma I had. I went back to Vietnam. And he woke up in the morning, he had no pain. But one thing I didn't write in the book, and I can mention here, he had the largest bowel movement he had in his life when he woke up in the morning. He really let go in the gut, what we hold, right? And at that point, he could visualize the people that he killed or tried to kill him, and he could see himself giving them love. They didn't trigger. It's interesting, as I was driving to give him, my last healing was two days before he left his body, then I was with him when he died, and I asked him, Charlie, how are you doing? He says, I'm doing great. I'm sending love to everybody, you know, including to your family. So he really transformed, you know, and lived for many years. So that's, that's, that's the power. So I, I hope to really, I call it open heart medicine. It was supposed to be my first book in Hebrew, got delayed. So I came up with my second book, which has some elements, but that's really, I hope I stay healthy enough and, and focused enough to put out this and share it because like my uh, one of my main spiritual teachers say, there is a certain stage in life when you went through training for decades and you really have something you can share. You know, that's why I took, I wrote my book only in my 60s and I was asked to write a book in my 40s. But now it's time for me not to get lazy and to share because it's, it is making a difference in people's life and what you do and I do and we all do, we're trying to bring a different flavor to medicine and health, right? I don't know if you're seeing it. I think it's a medical system, as advanced as it is, it's really collapsing. Regular doctors don't have the space, we are back to space, Wendy, to think, to be creative. It's so automated, it's scary. It's really scary. I mean, if they just took a moment, and I'm not any better than them, they just happen to be in the wrong place for too many years. So we have a big job, all of us, and that's why, you know, that's really what, what drives me, what drives you. And we see the difference, right? You see the difference in the patient, and, you know, right, right. we don't get tired from doing medicine. It's amazing, you know, because of the difference. So really, thank you for what you're doing, and we should all, you know, support each other and 
keep moving forward. Yeah. I mean, it really, when you were talking about your next book, it's it's like the appropriate transition in your career is now to contribute and bring it to more people so that your legacy continues. Right. Yeah. That's why I do education. It's, it's my third act. Yeah, definitely. That's a plan. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it was oh, great. Isaac, this is so great. Much. Thank you. I mean, I think this is a good we place have to, two hours, to uh, end. I, well, the, we're, we're definitely having you back on the podcast and we'll pick it up where we left. You, you won't have to, to twist my arm. I promise you. Well, we love playing with you. It. So it's fantastic. So I think we'll close it out here. Isaac, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for being on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, so and to the listeners, so thank you for joining us for another episode of the Five Journeys podcast. Live like you matter today. Thank you. Thank you. you.